also pay for the DSMB, so you don't have to worry about putting that in your budget. Um, voting members should have appropriate expertise in relevant scientific and ecological areas, and members are likely to be clinicians, methodologists, statisticians, lab scientists, ethicists, like priests and rabbis, and patient advocates. I want to point out that the chair is a very important person. The chair has to be impartial and be able to juggle the interests of the concerns of all the different members. And the members must be completely um, independent of the investigators, not be from the same center, and not have any financial, scientific, or other conflict of interest. All DSMB members sign 
uh, con conflict of interest form. Now, sometimes DSMB members do have a form of conflict of interest, and the interest has to be managed. But that's not ideal, and we try to avoid that. As I alluded to, in small single site studies, safety monitoring is often performed by a statistician in conjunction with a safety officer. This safety officer is actually appointed by the grantee institution, best if he or she is not at that institution. And this person reviews adverse events and serious adverse events on an ongoing basis to determine whether an action is needed. Sometimes, in larger trials, an additional independent medical monitor is needed. And this can occur in addition to the DSMB, and they review reports in real time, so they're seeing them as they occur. And in NIMPS trials, we will often tell um, the applicant whether they will need an um, independent medical monitor. In fact, every trial that even has a good score usually goes to our safety monitoring committee and we look at it and we try to decide whether we need a safety officer, an independent medical monitor, or a DSMB. The point of this is to illustrate that NINDS is the center of the universe. <laughs> so the DSMB is appointed by NINDS an advisory to NINDS. The DSMB liaison, who's often a project manager from my group, the Division of Clinical Research, is the person who interacts with both the funded trial and the DSMB members. And then, of course, the trial is NIMDS funded in this case. The DSMB activities. So data safety monitoring activities focus on several areas. They include looking at performance data, Patient recruitment and retention, as Dr. Grill talked about, very, very important, as well as dropout rates. We want to make sure that we're doing it in an ethical fashion. If we can't recruit or retain the subjects, then it's not worth doing. And I have seen trials stop for this. They look at safety reports. They consider treatment monitoring, interim analyses that are pre-specified, and stopping rates. The DSMB members are also important uh, responsible for the importance of the confidentiality of the data. And this is really, really important. Nothing is to be discussed outside that room. And that is the most important thing I say today. Recommending to DS, uh, NIDS whether to continue the trial or conclude it is obviously a big, big point. Usually the trial will continue unless there's something really egregious or outstanding in order to get them the maximum information, but sometimes the trials are put on hold. Monitoring patient recruitment retention rates, as we talked about, are really important to ensure that the end goals for recruitment are met. The DSMB can request to see unblinded and unblinded data. The DSMB can request reports and can advise the institute to start, stop, or modify the trial protocol. So this is the general design. So there's usually an open session followed by a closed session. In the open session, the topics include patient accrual, compliance with the protocol, any problems that are encountered, and the data here is blinded and presented in an aggregate fashion. In the closed session, this um, is unblinded. So safety and efficacy data are presented straight with um, essentially this is where confidentiality is even more important because nothing can be said outside the closed session to the open session investigators. And they will often recommend, but not make a decision, whether to start, stop, or modify a trial protocol. This is the overall meeting flow. In general, there is a closed executive session where the DSMP members and NIAPS DSMP liaison start to discuss, for example, in the first um, session, the trial protocol. And then there'll be an open session where the investigators and the um, NIMDS program directors, as well as the others that were in the closed session, <coughs> participate. And then there'll be a second closed session with, in addition, the study statistician will join the liaison and the DSMB members. And sometimes there's an open session where there's a summary of what's been discussed 
by Matt Allen's. So the first meeting is really, really important, and we try to do it in person. And the point here is to discuss the protocol and establish the monitoring guidelines, which should be pre-specified. And then afterwards, there are biannual meetings, usually one in person and one by conference call. And at this point, accumulating safety data is reviewed and the conduct of uh, interim analyses are performed. In addition, we have had emergency meetings called by the DSMB or INDS. So this can happen at any time. So if you sign up to be on the DSMB, you have to be aware of that. And so um, I just wanted to summarize that these array DSMBs are put into place to protect human subjects and from undue risk, for example, and to the degree possible, it's important to maintain the highest quality, safety, and efficacy for our clinical trials and their participants. Fortunately, Roger has agreed to review a few case studies to bring into light, and we can have a little bit of a conversation. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, you may notice that one of uh, uh, an older and similar uh, article that talks about a number of these case studies uh, was, was authored by Dr. Conway. Uh, this is the more recent one that is sort of an update. One of the things that uh, I think we're struggling with as a, as a research community is when you should and shouldn't have a DSMB. The original NIH um, guidance or, or guidelines really talk about the importance of the DSMB for phase three studies. And what we've seen in industry and in some academic settings is that they're starting to be used lots and lots in even earlier phase studies or in studies that don't seem to have much risk, um, uh, a high risk profile. And there's a question whether in some studies we may actually be overdoing it. So we're, I think we're struggling to find the right balance. Again, we try to kill as few people as possible. So the first example um, is from back in 1991. So this was the North American Symptomatic Carotid and Arterotomy Trial. And their investigation sought to determine whether carotid and arterotomy reduces the risk of stroke among patients with a recent CVA and ipsilateral carotid stenosis. And th this is the uh, abstract from the New England Journal article that published the result. And I want to just point out how it's worded. We report here the results in the 659 patients in the latter strata who had a hemisphere for retinal TIA or a non-disabling stroke within the 120 days before entry and had a, sto a stenosis of 70 to 99 percent. So this is a subgroup. Patients received optimal medical care and then some underwent surgery if they were randomized to that arm. Uh, patients were examined by neurologists, and if that neurologist had a patient with loss of all. Right table estimates of the cumulative risk of any ipsilateral stroke at two years were 26% in medical patients and 9% in surgical patients, and absolute risk reduction of 17%. So this was a, a very strong positive, uh, positive result. So let's look a little more detail on what happened here. So this trial was powered to detect a 50% reduction. Uh, in patients with high-grade stenosis and plan to have 600 patients followed for five years. So the model is you enroll these patients that are treated, they're, I'm sorry, they're randomized and treated, and then you follow them out for a long time to get a long-term estimate of risk of stroke. The stopping rule that the DSMB was asked to follow was that if there was a p-value less than 0.001 uh, for six months, so you, if you saw it at one meeting, Six months later, you had to still have a p-value less than 0.01. And the results were deemed unambiguous and clinically important. I would never allow language like that in a charter these days, because it's, it's way too soft. Um, and then there was also a futility rule, so that it looked like there wasn't much of a prospect of being able to demonstrate um, so, uh, protective effect of credit that our neighborhood would stop. So the DSMB looked at the accumulating data and stopped um, an early stop rate was recommended by the DSMB 
about one and a half years of follow-up in uh, the 650 applications. So the sample size is a little larger than the target. Good job. But the follow-up was less than one-third complete. This resulted in a clinical alert being circulated to physicians regarding the benefits of endirectin. So this is an example of early overwhelming efficacy because the trial was monitored by DSMD and they had a pre-specified rule for early stopping for success to get a positive result out, uh, out earlier. Here's a different example. You may notice that there are people in the course that uh, are on this paper. Um, uh, so this is a trial of uh, topiramate in ALS. We determined that long-term topiramate um, therapy is safe and slows to disease progression in patients with ALS, double-blind placebo control. It was randomized two to one with more heavier randomization to the active arm um, uh, against placebo. The primary outcome measure was the rate of change in upper extremity motor function. Um, and the result was that the patients treated with a pyramid showed a faster decrease in arm strength during um, 12 months. And this had a p-value of 0.012. Um, and then they go on to show that it didn't affect some other things. Okay. So what happened in this trial? So it was a randomized trial. And because the investigators were highly optimistic, as you have to be to be willing to do this kind of work about the benefit, the trial had a pre-specified open extension. So the idea is that if you're randomized and after the trial was over, you could continue open label. Um, but at the end of the randomized component, the DSMB recommended immediate termination of the open label part. So if the DSMB hadn't been looking at this, the patients wouldn't have known to come off of the label until the publication came out, although most IRBs would have looked at the continued review, and if they had asked for the efficacy data, should have also um, closed the open extension based on the continued review. And it was closed, and this, this slide changes every year, um, because if you read the paper, it's a little hard to tell why they recommended early termination. There were two problems. One was that there was a surprisingly large excess number of cases of thromboembolism in the active treatment group. This was, as far as I can tell, and I'm certainly not an expert in this area, um, highly unexpected. So there was a safety signal that was unexpected and I think is unexplained unless you know an explanation. What? Dehydration. Dehydration from the tumor. Okay. Um, but there was also a, a negative treatment effect apparent treatment effect on the primary outcome of motor strength that was obviously um, uh, very concerning. This is an example of two unexpected things. No one thought the active treatment would appear to be harmful, and I don't think it was anticipated that the, that the drug would have increased the symptom rate of uh, thromboembolic disease. So that's a case of stopping early for an unexpected safety signal. Here is uh, an, an old example of, of in one of the most common patterns of folly among um, uh, academic physicians. That's the chasing the subgroup. Okay? So this was a study of uh, uh, antiplatelet agents, uh, to I don't know what I'm saying, topopathy, I can't even say that, um, on the risk of stroke or death, and it's being compared to aspirin. Uh, the medications were randomly assigned to three, over 3,000 patients with TIAs or mild persistent focal cerebral or retinal ischemia, terminology I don't see anymore. And they were looking at the three-year event rate for non-fatal stroke or death from any cause. And it was 17% for the experimental agent and 19% for aspirin. So comparing 17% to 19, which seems really close, they reworded that as a 12% reduction um, and they managed magically, even though they had a confidence interval at cross zero, to come up with a p-value of 0.048. That's because the statistical method used to calculate the p-value wasn't exactly the same for the confidence interval. Um, and then, in looking uh, at these data, they concluded that the, the clopidine was somewhat more effective than aspirin, although the risks of side effects were greater. So this is sort of a mixed conclusion. But the investigator team went back and looked at the data. 
And when they look back at the data, they look at the subgroup of, of non-white patients. And what they found was that the one-year cumulative event rate, notice we just went from one year to three years to one year, per 100 patients for a non-real stroke or death from any cause was 5.5 for the active arm, or for the experimental arm, and 10.6 for aspirin, and apparent 48% reduction. So looking at this subgroup, they suddenly see a much, much bigger effect. So I don't know how many of you have seen this in, in your areas of expertise, but anytime people do an unplanned subgroup analysis, they cherry pick something and they get excited, you should run. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm sorry? I think it's called the jelly bean. The green jelly bean? Yeah. Um, it is amazing to me how, how people who know about this pattern and in investigative behavior can exhibit the behavior themselves and be so sure that for them it's different because this time it's real. Um, but moving on. So a substantial amount of money, I'm sure, was invested in the follow-up study where they randomized the same two um, uh, in, uh, agents in just non-white subjects. And this blinded study was halted after six and a half years. How many years does it take to get a study going, Jeff? Well, if you're lucky, three years so. Okay, so this is 10 years of work, okay? So it was, it was halted after six and a half years. That's a low estimate, okay? Based on less than 1% probability that uh, the experimental agent could be shown to be superior to aspirin. It also had more, more um, adverse events. And so this is an example of any deity that you might believe in coming down and hitting you over the head and saying, you idiot, it was a subgroup, don't go after it, it doesn't work. And it's a remarkably negative study. The other thing that's remarkable about it is the futility rule. If you have to wait for less than a 1% chance to realize you are meeting a dead horse, um, I don't know, don't have an answer, an end to that phrase. Okay. Um, there was a 50% chance aspirin was, would be better. Um, they didn't continue the trial to prove aspirin was better because aspirin was the cheaper, safer, um, better understood alternative, and they didn't need to prove that the standard of care was better. Okay, so I have not done this before. This says no pictures because I really don't want you taking pictures of the next few slides. I saw someone do this at a meeting recently. And what was most amazing to me, this was a meeting that had to do with um, uh, people who do blood banking and resuscitation research and support of special operations. So half the people in the room are special operations forces. And the guy at the front says, I'm going to show you some data. Please don't take a picture. And he flips the slide, and I kid you not, the guy in this chair goes up with his phone. And I'm thinking, these are people are all trying to kill. Are you listening? Okay. I, what I wanted to do, but I was too scared, is I wanted to take a picture of the dude. Okay? So I get and then to show like a grave or something. I, I, that's, by the way, this is an absolutely true story. Um, it's what they do, Roger. So what they do to the to do to the So so the guy turns the screen on and he looks at me and says, I, in, in a voice I, I can't even imitate the voice. He says, Picture the people who who their life is spent directing special operations forces into very difficult environments, they can speak with a level of authority that, that I can only aspire to. And what basically said is, I told you not to take a picture. Okay. So, no picture of the next two slides, okay? Wait, wait, wait. 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 Wait, Okay, go ahead. That's one more point. Okay, the reason is, these data are not actually public, I don't think. The, the general results are public. But this is actually what the DSMB saw at the 151 patient analysis for Dawn. So this is a graph I oriented um, some of you to um, on the first night, where the dots, the blue and red dots, show every individual patient. 
What I didn't explain about the first night is that the data are immature. So small dots, those patients have only gotten to 30 days. Big dots, they've gotten to 90 days. There's fits to the curves. The blue being higher than the red says of the model-based estimate of the expected utility-weighted MRS is higher in the um, thrombectomy group. Red would say standard is better. And what you can see at this point is that for almost all core infarct sizes, there's pretty good evidence, um, including some near separation curves for small infarct sizes, uh, of the expected benefit. And then the curves come together out towards 50. The pre-specified rule for this study was that it was not allowed to stop for efficacy at 150. It could only stop for futility. Okay. So the, the, the text at the bottom is a slight modification of the instruction we got from the, the Statistical Analysis Center, which said not think, what do you think of these data? It said, this is what you should do. Okay? And this is part of how it is that we act when they um, remain faithful to the pre-specified trial design. At 200 subjects, this is what the data look like. And now you have no overlapping of the curves. And you have um, a model-based estimates that show uh, very strong evidence of efficacy, as was discussed in the first evening. You may notice um, that there's relatively sparse data out to the very large infarct sizes. But what's interesting um, is that the curves show you the, the relative lack of a effect of infarct size, at least out to about <coughs> 30, maybe even 40 um, on the expected MRS. Remember, these patients are carefully selected for mismatch. Okay, so it's it's not that big infarcts aren't worse than small infarcts. It's that um, infarcts selected for mismatch behave differently than those that are unselected for mismatch. I just thought I'd show you what the DSMB actually looks like in, um, in a recent trial. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, conclusions. First of all, you never actually know as much about a trial going in as you, as you expect. So people spend time designing and working on clinical trials, as you've all learned, working on your own projects, because they are incredibly enthusiastic about what they're studying. They're very hopeful. And because if you didn't do that, this would just be massive. But what that means is they tend to overestimate the chance of benefit, underestimate the chance of harm, and overestimate their confidence in all of the different things you might predict about the patient population, the outcomes, and the way the patients respond uh, to therapy. So the purpose of the DSMB is to stop the trial early if it should be stopped because of overwhelming benefit, or evidence of harm, or futility, or because there's other evidence out that means that the, the risk-benefit basis for the trial is no longer valid, like another study just read out that shows that this is no longer an important question um, to answer. So the DSMP needs to actively monitor efficacy, safety, utility. They need to, whenever possible, remain um, uh, um, loyal to um, the original trial design. And, and ensure that the original trial design remains appropriate in the clinical setting. And if we do, though, if we do this, it both helps minimize the risk to the human subjects, and it helps ensure that the resources that we spend on clinical research are wisely spent, and we don't continue to spend money when it's either not the right thing or a good investment uh, moving forward. Great. I will stop there, and I'm happy to take any questions on DSMDs or uh, there were stories. I'm sure Rabbit probably would have Thank you very much. Mechanistically, for example, trying to check these before right now, where 
It's a very sick patient population. They have a lot of that things happen to them. And so SAE reports, serious adverse events, are coming in all the time. They're first seen by the medical monitor, who reads them for completeness, asks questions, why did they get a transfusion here, and there was no hemoglobin documented here, and does two things. First of all, ensures the quality or the completeness of the information we're getting on adverse events. And is a human who sees them in near real time, so if there was something really surprising, wow, three people had their heads fall off, they would bring it to our attention, even if it was between the period we were scheduled to have a um, scheduled meeting. Um, so they're, they're very important. Now, they are often employed by the CRO or the company, so they often don't have, and this is different than the NIH model, um, so they often don't have the independence, um, but my personal experience with them has been that they are very good and diligent. Sometimes it's, it's a, a, the phraseology there is the medical safety monitor, and an independent medical monitor, sometimes that also means for like a smaller, lower risk study, the whole, the whole deal, they function more like a, a DSMB for a, a smaller study. I've seen that. I have, I have been a medical monitor for a cluster randomized trial, the Dix Hallback maneuver. You know, if a bunch of people's heads fall off because of the Dix Hallback maneuver, they'll shut down our study. But we don't have a medical safety monitor reviewing adverse events because sometimes people get nauseated because of the Dix Hallback maneuver. However, in the Rampart study of midazolam and status epilepticus, very sick patients who were coming in and getting benzodiazepines in the ambulance. There was a medical safety monitor who was reviewing adverse effects, people who got intubated and things like that, and determining whether those were attributed to the intervention. But there's also a separate DSMB that was regularly meeting and looking at all of the larger bits of data in terms of all the safety events. So, maybe this will make it clear. The um, minimum level of monitoring is PI and IRB. And if you move up having a safety officer in addition to the I and IRB, and then in a larger trial, a DSMB, and then the highest would be a DSMB plus an independent medical monitor. I actually have a hand up on that that I can put into base camp. That might be helpful. Yes? You mentioned about conflict of interest. Given how small our communities are, I would anticipate that one potential conflict of interest is knowing the PI, and so how often can you actually find people for DSMB who don't, who aren't already friends? Right, so I think that um, knowing the PI is not necessarily a conflict of interest, but working on a project with that PI might be, and so it would be important to disclose that and then have the sponsor decide if it's a conflict that would interfere in the study. Who does have experience with this? I think, I think in certain types of uh, diseases, it's a, it's a small world, but I think what Robin points out, if you have direct grant or contractual or ongoing research direct collaboration with an individual, they're probably not best to be, be chairing DSMB, but it doesn't mean you haven't met them at meetings and you're not, not friendly with them. Um, but if, it, if there was some other external reason, like you train together in residency or something, but you still have no ongoing, research collaboration or they were your uh, you know thesis advisor those things are probably sort of permanently exclusionary but I think you know knowing somebody and, and respecting their work it, it's not necessarily going to be um, take away their independence sometimes we can put a firewall in between the investigator and the data for example there are ways to um, manage conflicts if necessary there's commonly an aging requirement, uh, not for the person, but for the relationship, um, which is that if, for example, you publish a paper together, some organizations say that if it was within a year, that's too close a relationship, some say three years, some want to know if you've ever published anything with somebody. Um, so it's really some value to it. There were years ago, um, Susan Ellenberg, a statistician who was at the FDA, is now at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, gave up in her role um, as a, a primary thought leader on, on study oversight at the FDA at the time, and had this graph, and the graph showed a continuum. And at one extreme was complete absence of conflict of interest. And at the other was, you know, large conflict of interest. And then, you know, it all looked like, we all expected her to say you've got no conflict of interest. And then what she actually said verbally 
I'm not sure if it ever showed up on the slide, is that, yeah, if you go to the no conflict of interest, you also get complete ignorance about the field, right? And if you want complete ignorance, that's okay, but, but you gotta know what you're getting. And so I think a lot of us, when we're putting together memberships on DSMBs, we actually try to get some um, variety in the level of familiarity. So I want somebody who really knows stroke, and I want somebody who's really smart, who doesn't, couldn't care less about stroke, and I want to have both of their opinions heard. And then Robin specifically made the comment about the chair being really important. A key to running a good DSMB meeting is that you hear both the majority and the minority opinions, because sometimes it's the person who hasn't been tainted by knowledge of the field who has the best insight into, into what's going on. I, and I just need to point out that there are financial and non-financial conflicts of interest. And over the years, my increasingly strong impression is that it is the non-financial ones that are the most biasing. So I am much more worried about somebody who has a long-standing academic feud with somebody on the trial, okay, or is running a competing trial, because then I never want this one then, because if that one reads out first, my 10 years of work is done. That is much more worrisome to me than the person who may have invested once in a company that does a similar product. I want to know about both, but they are different. But this idea that, that academics are pure, oh my god. Okay. So you talked a little bit about the recommendations of the DSB to make like the stopping for overall superiority or some kind of stop at the utility. I was wondering if you talked about other types of recommendations they can make and that they should not make in their role. And I guess where I'm specifically going is the loyalty to the design. Oh, okay. Okay, so the I think what Michelle is getting at is that the The DSMB is commonly populated by people have, who have expertise and are, are uh, recognized as experts in the field who are used to having input into things. And so when they're asked to look at a, at a study design, they often feel as if they could have done parts of it better, which may be true, and they want to make recommendations against about modifying that design. Um, because modifying the design, um, so there's two stages of, of the DSMB's life in my mind. There's before they have seen any data whatsoever, and then their opinions about modifying the trial design are just as valid as anybody else's. They have, there's no bias in their, their decisions, they can ask questions. So what I'd like to see in a charter is an expectation that the DSMB meets before, in person before any patient enrollment has occurred and can provide comments on the protocol. And at that point, they can make recommendations for wording, wording for clarifications, for stopping rules that's free game, and then the, the sponsor, which uh, may be the NIH Institute, or the PI can make decisions when they want to incorporate it. Once the DSMB has seen any unblinded data, they are forever tainted, and they should not make except in cases of protecting patient safety, any recommendations for a change in the trial design. And this is to avoid the bias or the increase in error rate that's associated with changing stuff to play what you think is doing a little better um, or modifying the trial because you're looking at the data and sort of playing with it and driving it. And it's, like, human nature being what it is, once you look at data and you see the decisions about the design that you now wish were different, it's really tempting to say, God, we really, now we really should exclude the 65-year-olds and above. Okay, but you really can't do that unless it's driven by, by a safety uh, consideration. Is that what you're getting at? Okay. I was trying to get the right answer. Okay. Anything else? Dr. Gavin? So I just reiterate what Robin said at the very beginning, which is um, this is also another reason for people in this room to be interested in being on DSMBs, because you bring in a different viewpoint um, that's valuable, and you may say, well, I know I never really 
ran a clinical trial but you're experts in your diseases or your fields or you're at least an expert in if not the subspecialty of that particular study but it really is an important perspective and i have to say that i'm very grateful to having been put on a dsmb early in my career um, which is for a couple reasons one is where i met chris coffee <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I'm not grateful, or is it? No. <laughs> but, but I learned so much about clinical trials just from that DSMB, including, you know, things that went wrong, things that went right, listening to all the other smart people around the room. A patient advocate was on that DSMB. I learned the value of a patient advocate on a DSMB. Lots of stuff to learn there. So definitely, um, you volunteer to do that. Other questions? We've got like three minutes to kill before the group photo. The group photo is not optional. <laughs> <laughs>